Let's do a little bit of intern candidate role play. You're interviewing for an internship as an analyst at a top four bank in Canada, and you're given this interview question. You're asked to look over the following image, which is a sequence of three by three grids with dots in them. You're then asked to click the piece below that would best fit next in the sequence. What do you say? What do you choose? Since we can barely see these grids unless I turn my camera brightness way up, let me give you some cards that show the same exact sequence. So this is what we're working with, and to most people it seems like a pretty difficult, if not completely inane question. Clearly, Canadian banks hire only the most rugged of intellectuals. There's no pattern explicitly spelled out in this sequence of grids, and that's not not necessarily a problem. We use a sort of lazy notation in mathematics all the time where things aren't explicitly stated. For example, it would not be unusual to communicate a sequence to people by writing this, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, dot, dot, dot. We haven't explicitly specified this sequence and what term comes next, but most people would look at this sequence and assume that 32 comes next. There is, of course, a well-known problem concerning connecting points on a circle and counting the number of regions that connecting those points splits the circle circle into, and in this problem, you end up with this sequence followed by 31 and then some other numbers, so it doesn't exactly go as you would expect. 32 isn't the number that comes next in every instance of this sequence. But what makes this an acceptable way to specify a sequence is that there is a very clear, most obvious pattern, which is that each term is doubling to get the next term. And so the most obvious next term would be 32. And without any additional context, this is what every reasonable person would think the sequence is. So where there could be some ambiguity, the idea is that it's not really a problem as long as there's still some most obvious solution. In the original Reddit thread where this was posted, link in the description, people seem to agree the most obvious pattern is the addition of four dots in each grid. So we start with one, and then in the next grid we have five dots, then in the next grid four are added and we get to nine. The idea is now this is completely full, so if we add another dot, we're just going to get one new dot on a blank slate, and so, of course, if we add another four, we would just get four dots on this grid. The grid overflows when we add more than nine dots, which explains how we go from here to here by adding four. This seems fairly plausible. It is a simple pattern observable in this sequence. And if that's the pattern we're supposed to notice, adding another four dots to this picture to get the next picture in the sequence, we should get a picture with eight dots, which forces the answer to be number five. This option has eight dots following that plus four pattern, whereas none of the other options do. Another way to justify the choice of option five here is to consider the sequence of the numbers of dots in the columns of the grids while disregarding empty columns. By that, I mean this first column has one dot, the next column with any dots is this one, which has three dots, then we have two dots, then three, 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 and then one, and then three. Since these last two terms in the sequence are also the first two terms, we may be expected to suppose that the sequence continues in this way, so that whatever option we choose, the number of dots in the following columns should continue in this repeating sequence and thus be two, three, three, etc. Of course, looking at the available options, we see that only option five follows that pattern, two dots, three dots, three dots. This pattern falls apart if we don't ignore the empty columns when writing out this sequence, but still, it is another possible explanation for option five being the correct choice to this question. I'd say the biggest problem with those two possible solutions is they pretty much entirely ignore the layout of the dots on these grids. Now, is the layout of the dots important? Well, I would say there are three points in support of the assumption that the layout of the dots on the grids 
is important. Firstly, the dots are on grids, so they do have some layout, and a person is generally going to assume this information that is provided to us is to be used to figure out what the correct answer is. Surely, for the problem to be giving us a red herring of the pattern of dots in the grid, like that's information that doesn't matter, that would be truly devious, since there's no context here at all. How are we to know what should and shouldn't be ignored? Furthermore, when we look at the available options, option 2 and option 4 both have five dots. Thus, the only thing distinguishing these two answers is the layout of the dots, another point supporting the fact that the layout of the dots should be important. Of course, if option five is correct, as we have already argued, then the fact that these two options have the same number of dots is pretty irrelevant. But of course, that begs the question of whether or not the layout of the dots matters at all, because we had to ignore the layout to get this as our current correct answer. The final point in support of the layout of the dots mattering is that one may believe we should be able to deduce the correct answer only from the sequence. That is to say, we shouldn't need to be provided possible answers in order to know what the correct answer is. However, since each possible answer involves some layout of the dots, we should be able to figure out the layout of the correct answer just based on the provided information. If the layout of the dots didn't matter, and we believed that the plus 4 pattern was the correct explanation of this sequence, then we wouldn't necessarily come up with this as our solution unless it was provided to us, because if we ignore the layout, this empty square could be anywhere, so there are many other answers we might provide. So again, if you think we should be able to deduce the answer just from the sequence provided, and without looking at the possible answers, and and indeed, if you believe that there should be just one unique solution, then the layout of the dots has to be important. Unfortunately, I've fiddled with these grids in all sorts of ways, trying to come up with possible solutions that take into account the layout of the dots, different base number systems and all sorts of things. And you can see people on the original Reddit thread trying stuff like that too, and there just doesn't seem to be any answer presenting itself. One possibility that seems so close, and perhaps perhaps only doesn't work because maybe there's an error in the question, is what if this dot here was gone? Then you can see that there's some symmetry being created. This and this are mirror images, and they appear, of course, on opposite sides of a fully symmetric grid. We may expect then that this symmetry should continue, and that the correct answer, the next grid in this sequence, should be the mirror image of this first grid in the sequence. That is, we might think the correct answer is a grid that has only a dot in the upper right corner thus completing this mirror image. But of course, that is not one of the options. One of the first things I noticed about the layout of the dots in these three grids is that it kind of looks like the numbers 9, 8, 7. Except this 9 has been reflected, this 8 is a stretch, and well, 7 doesn't look so bad. But that doesn't really get us anywhere, because then what's the explanation of this first grid? And what would that imply as a solution? None of these jump out as representing 6 in any any particular way, and why would the 9 be reflected if the 8 and the 7 aren't reflected? Well, 8 is symmetric, so maybe the 8 is reflected. But then why isn't the 7 reflected? It all just goes nowhere. Indeed, most of the simple arguments seem to support option 5. However, let me offer you another explanation which supports option 1. You see, there is a thing called a digital root. This is a number obtained from some other number by adding its digits together repeatedly until a single digit number is arrived at. For for example, if we have the number 123, its digital root is found by summing its digits, which gives us 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 6. Another example would be 83. The digital root of 83 is found by adding its digits to get 11, but because that's not a one digit number, we would then have to add the digits of 11 and find that the digital root is 2. Now consider taking digital roots of numbers raised to the power of themselves. 1 to the 1 is equal to 1, and the digital root of that, of course, 
course, is 1. Then 2 to the power of 2 is equal to 4, the digital root of which is 4. Getting more interesting, there is 3 to the power of 3, which is 27, the digital root of which is 2 plus 7, or 9. If we suppose that the sequence started at 0 to the power of 0, which just for this sake, let's say is equal to 1, then the sequence starts with a digital root of 1. Now, if we were to continue this sequence, calculating the digital roots of n to the power of n, eventually we would arrive at the sequence 1, 5, 9, 4, 7. This sequence of digital roots occurs repeatedly throughout this sequence as you continue it. Now, what's the importance of 1, 5, 9, 4, 7? Well, let's look again at our grids and the numbers of dots in them. 1 plus 4 gave us that 5, plus 4 gave us that 9, plus 4 with the overflow brought us back to 4. So maybe the number of dots in the solution should be 7, the next number in this sequence of digital roots of n to the power of n. Unfortunately, when we look at the possible answers, none of them have 7 dots. So we may be left scratching our heads until we remember that we had to skip a bunch of terms in the sequence to get to this 1, 5, 5947. In particular, we had to skip a total of 10 terms of the sequence. So this digital root of 1 is the digital root of 10 to the power of 10. So if we had to skip 10 terms to get to the first number that represents the grid with a dot in it, then perhaps after 4, we need to skip another 10 terms to get the next thing in our sequence of dots and find the solution. If we skip the next 10 digital roots, the very next one after that skipping is going to be 9, precisely the number of dots in option 1. Is that a coincidence? Well, Maybe. Another more straightforward argument in favor of option 1 is that there's some pattern underlying the sequence of dots, of course there has to be, otherwise we can't possibly find the correct answer. Whatever the pattern is, it necessitates that no dot has an empty box above it. You can see that every single column, if it has any dots, it has a dot in that first box. Now the only option available that fits that rule is option 1. For example, in option 2, column 1 does have a dot, but that dot has an empty box above it. In option 5, for example, column 1 has a dot, but that dot has an empty box above it. That breaks the pattern we see in the provided sequence where no dot has an empty box above it, thus supporting option 1 as the correct answer. But again, that's what makes this such a stupid question to try to find a correct answer to. There's just no most obvious pattern that very well agrees with all of the provided information. We began with some potential potential simple explanations, but they totally ignore the pattern of the dots, which is a pretty significant piece of information included in the grids. This all of course begs the question of whether or not the purpose of this puzzle in the interview is to actually see if the candidate can find the correct answer. The purpose may actually be to see the problem solving strategies of the candidate, and to see how they grapple with a very non-obvious problem. On the other hand, the purpose may be to see how much of the candidate's time Time they're willing to waste on a heap of honky-tonk hogwash, in which case perhaps they failed dramatically the moment they sat down to interview with this company. Let me know what you think this puzzle is supposed to accomplish, or if in fact you have a strong case for correct answer, but let's finish with a couple arguments for option Four. A very interesting explanation I saw is to imagine overlapping these grids. Then, if a box has an even number of dots, it should be empty in the correct choice. If a box has an odd number of dots, the box should have a dot in the correct choice. So let's see how that leads us to option four. Look at this first box. If we overlap all the grids, the first box will have a total of one, two, three dots. That's an odd number, so in the correct choice, it should be filled in. If we were to look at this box here, the third box of row one, there would be a total of one, two, dots if we overlap all the grids. That's even. 
and so in the correct choice, we would suppose it should be empty. Already, this eliminates all options except for option four. And indeed, if you look at all of the other boxes as we overlap these grids, it will agree completely with option four following this pattern. That's a very interesting explanation because it does take the layout of the dots into account and it exactly specifies option four. There's no other layout of dots we could get that would satisfy this pattern. When we respect this overlapping pattern where even dots should be an empty box and odd dots should be a filled in box, that completely specifies this particular option. The problem with this solution is the word sequence. The word sequence suggests that the order of these grids matters. However, this strategy of overlapping them and looking at the number of dots is not affected by order. We could put these grids in whatever order we please, and if we followed this explanation, we would still get option four. This makes it seem like perhaps a bad explanation to a problem that concerns a sequence. Ah, but not is all lost. If we're willing to stretch our imaginations a little bit, we can still get a justification for option four, which does respect order. This explanation for option four is due to intrepid Redditor button photo file. Indeed, if God loves him, then his gravestone will read something other than intrepid Redditor, but for our discussion today, that is his most significant role. Now, how much do we have to stretch for this explanation? Well, in 1987, the game The Legend of Zelda was released for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Well, certainly not the greatest game of all time, since that is Tetris for the Nintendo Entertainment System. The Legend of Zelda is a very legendary and well-regarded classic, and to most players, the most standout parts of these Zelda games are the dungeons. This is a map of what's generally the first dungeon in The Legend of Zelda for the Nintendo Entertainment System. It's called the Eagle. You can see that it vaguely resembles an eagle with its wings spread, and here is the head of the eagle. The negative space around the head, namely this one empty square, resembles that one dot in the top left corner of the first grid in our sequence. All right, connection established. What does the next dungeon in the game look like? The next dungeon is called the moon, and this one is even more of a stretch than the last one. The intrepid Redditor who provided this explanation saw a connection between this shape in the second grid and the negative space somewhere around this map. Maybe it's, you know, that shape there, it's like a, you know, it's like that, but reflected. That, that seems pretty convincing. What about the next dungeon? The next one is called the Manji, and it looks like this. Of course, this connection to the third grid is obvious. Negative space just forms a square, and so, of course, the third grid is just a filled-in square, and I'm content to move on to the next map. This next one I think is called the lizard, and you can see the negative space here in the dungeon map. Foop, foop. Ah, uh, just like that seven, right? That fully explains it. Indeed, the sequence of the dots in these grids is explained by the negative space in the dungeon maps of the Nintendo Entertainment System game, The Legend of Zelda. And so by referring to the fifth map, which I believe is called the snake, we can get an accurate solution to the puzzle. Notice the negative space here has this pattern of over, down, over. And the only option that agrees with is option four, over, down, over. And so this problem is settled. But do let me know what you think the solution to this problem is and what your reaction would be if it was presented to you in a job interview. I think it's a pretty bad question. What the actual solution is, is anybody's guess. And what the interviewers are trying to learn from including this question, who's to say? But thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet.